Moths that fly by day are not properly to be called moths. They do not excite that pleasant sense of dark autumn nights and ivy blossom, which the commonest yellow underwing asleep in the shadow of the curtain never fails to rouse in us. They are hybrid creatures, neither gay like butterflies, nor sombre like their own species. Nevertheless, the present specimen, with his narrow, hay-coloured wings, fringed with a tassel of the same colour, seemed to be content with life. It was a pleasant morning, mid-September, mild, benignant, yet with a keener breath than that of the summer months. The plough was already scoring the field opposite the window, and where the share had been, the earth was pressed flat and gleamed with moisture. Such vigour came rolling in from the fields and the down beyond that it was difficult to keep the eyes strictly turned upon the book. The rooks too were keeping one of their annual festivities, soaring round the treetops until it looked as if a vast net with thousands of black knots in it had been cast up into the air, which, after a few moments, sank slowly down upon the trees until every twig seemed to have a knot at the end of it. Then, suddenly, the net would be thrown into the air again in a wider circle this time, with the utmost clamour and vociferation, as though to be thrown into the air and settle slowly down upon the treetops were a tremendously exciting experience. The same energy which inspired the rooks, the ploughmen, the horses, and even, it seemed, the lean, bareback downs, sent the moth fluttering from side to side of his square of the window pane. One could not help watching him. One was, indeed, conscious of a queer feeling of pity for him. The possibilities of pleasure seemed that morning so enormous and so various that to have only a moth's part in life, and a day moth's at that, appeared a hard fate, and his zest in enjoying his meagre opportunities to the fall, pathetic. He flew vigorously to one corner of his compartment, and, after waiting there a second, flew across to the other. What remained for him but to fly to a third corner and then to a fourth? That was all he could do, in spite of the size of the downs, the width of the sky, the far-off smoke of houses, and the romantic voice now and then of a steamer out at sea. What he could do, he did. Watching him, it seemed as if a fibre, very thin but pure, of the enormous energy of the world had been thrust into his frail and diminutive body. As often as he crossed the pane, I could fancy that a thread of vital light became visible. He was little or nothing but life. Yet, because he was so small and so simple a form of the energy that was rolling in at the open window and driving its way through so many narrow and intricate corridors in my own brain and in those of other human beings, there was something marvellous, as well as pathetic, about him. It was as if someone had taken a tiny bead of pure life and, decking it as lightly as possible with down and feathers, had set it dancing and zigzagging to show us the true nature of life. Thus displayed, one could not get over the strangeness of it. One is apt to forget all about life, seeing it humped and bossed and garnished and cumbered so that it has to move with the greatest circumspection and dignity. Again, the thought of all that life might have been had he been born in any other shape caused one to view his simple activities with a kind of pity. After a time, tired by his dancing, apparently, he settled on the window ledge in the sun, and the queer spectacle being at an end, I forgot about him. Then, looking up, my eye was caught by him. He was trying to resume his dancing, but seemed either so stiff or so awkward that he could only flutter to the bottom of the window pane, and when he tried to fly across it, he failed. Being intent on other matters, I watched these futile attempts for a time without thinking, unconsciously waiting for him to resume his flight as one waits for a machine that has stopped momentarily to start again without considering the reason of its failure. After perhaps a seventh attempt, he slipped from the wooden ledge and fell, fluttering his wings, onto his back, 
on the windowsill. The helplessness of his attitude roused me. It flashed upon me that he was in difficulties. He could no longer raise himself. His legs struggled vainly. But as I stretched out a pencil, meaning to help him to write himself, it came over me that the failure and awkwardness were the approach of death. I laid the pencil down again. The legs agitated themselves once more. I looked as if for the enemy against which he struggled. I looked out of doors. What had happened there? Presumably it was midday, and work in the fields had stopped. Stillness and quiet had replaced the previous animation. The birds had taken themselves off to feed in the brooks. The horses stood still. Yet the power was there all the same. Massed outside, indifferent, impersonal, not attending to anything in particular. Somehow it was opposed to the little hay-coloured moth. It was useless to try to do anything. One could only watch the extraordinary efforts made by those tiny legs against an oncoming doom which could, had it chosen, have submerged an entire city. Not merely a city, but masses of human beings. Nothing, I knew, had any chance against death. Nevertheless, after a pause of exhaustion, the legs fluttered again. It was superb, this last protest, and so frantic that he succeeded at last in writing himself. One's sympathies, of course, were all on the side of life. Also, when there was nobody to care or to know... This gigantic effort on the part of an insignificant little moth, against a power of such magnitude, to retain what no one else valued or desired to keep, moved one strangely. Again, somehow one saw life, a pure bead. I lifted the pencil again, useless though I knew it to be, but even as I did so, the unmistakable tokens of death showed themselves. The body relaxed and instantly grew stiff. The struggle was over. The insignificant little creature now knew death. As I looked at the dead moth, this minute wayside triumph of so great a force over so mean an antagonist filled me with wonder. Just as life had been strange a few minutes before, so death was now as strange. The moth having righted himself now lay most decently and uncomplainingly composed. Oh yes, he seemed to say. Death is stronger than I am. Thank you so very much for listening. I really enjoyed that little piece by Virginia Woolf. I hadn't read it before until I discovered it when uh, browsing various classic pieces of literature and short stories and whatnot. And um, I enjoyed it just on the first read through and then found it particularly poignant when I discovered that it was seemingly written just uh, a, a matter of weeks or months before Virginia Woolf died by suicide at the age of 59, back on the 28th of March, 1941. So the piece clearly seems to be Virginia Woolf spying this this moth that happens to be in the last moments of its life 
and through this activity that she sees both within the room and outside through the window she's ruminating on larger themes of the meaning of life and and death um so yeah i just i just found it really fascinating i would love to hear what you thought of it in the comments and um let me know if you'd like to hear some more work from Virginia Woolf, whether one of these uh, short non-fiction essays, of which I believe she wrote quite a few, or a, a short story of hers, or maybe of a particular favourite. You could also let me know whether you enjoyed this particular format, something on the short side, whether it's a short story, a non-fiction essay like this. Um, I know some of you prefer a, a much longer audiobook, several hours long, that you can just have on in the background whilst you're doing other things and sort of lose yourself in a grander story. But maybe maybe this short format of just 10, 20, 30 minutes is still something that interests you. I mean, I have read and shared various short stories on my channel over the years, but I mainly focus on, on longer works. So do let me know if you still appreciate these shorter readings as well. If you have enjoyed this, please do leave a like on the video. Those thumbs up really do help my videos to get spotted and for my channel to grow. Let's the all-powerful YouTube algorithm know that I'm doing something right. Comments also really do help the channel to grow and the videos to get noticed. And a massive thank you to my channel members here on YouTube, as well as my patrons over on Patreon. That financial support that you offer is absolutely magnificent. And for those of you that don't know, channel members and patrons are also able to access a pretty huge downloadable ad-free library that contains all of the content that I've ever shared on this YouTube channel, even on my previous YouTube channel, and it's updated with every new piece that I produce, as well as containing a lot of just exclusive extra content that you can only find in that folder. So it's a little, little perk, a little bit of a bonus for your support. So you take care wherever you are and whatever you're up to. And I'll read to you soon.